Então, muito boa tarde a todas e a todos. Sejam muito bem-vindos a mais uma palestra do nosso ciclo de palestras Hannah Arendt, Quem Sou Eu para Julgar. Esta semana temos connosco a professora Sophie Loidolt, que leciona Filosofia no Instituto de Filosofia da Universidade Técnica de Darmstadt, onde coordena a área de Filosofia Prática. Foi professora visitante no Departamento de Filosofia da Universidade de Kassel, na Alemanha, e professora assistente no Departamento de Filosofia da Universidade de Viena, na Áustria, onde se formou. Fez pesquisa na New School for Social Research, em Nova York, na Universidade de Saint-Denis, em Paris, nos arquivos Husserl, em Louvaina, e no Centro de Pesquisa da Subjetividade, em Copenhaga. É professora visitante recorrente neste centro, sendo membro do projeto Who Are We? Self-Identity, Social Cognition and Collective Intentionality, financiado pela União Europeia. A sua pesquisa foca-se em temas como intersubjetividade, ética e filosofia social de uma perspectiva fenomenológica, teorias políticas da ação, subjetivação e subjetividade no contexto das perspectivas de primeira, segunda e terceira pessoas, experiência, normatividade e justificação epistémica e normativa, esferas pública e privada na era digital, dimensões existenciais da lei, concepções fenomenológicas da identidade pessoal, intencionalidade, consciência, relação mente-mundo, experiência conceitual e não conceitual, filosofia transcendental e idealismo transcendental, principalmente em Kant e Husserl, teorias do novo, do novo realismo. Publicou recentemente a obra Phenomenology of Plurality, Hannah Arendt on Political Intersubjectivity, e é co-editora da série Phenomenology da editora Alber. A palestra de hoje intitula-se Hannah Arendt's Phenomenology of Plurality and the Role of Judgment in Actualizing Plurality. Dear Sophie, thank you once again for accepting our invitation. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Nuno, um, for the invitation. Uh, hello, good evening, good afternoon to everybody. Um, yes, I'm happy to sort of be uh, be here. It's a strange thing to say, but uh, being communication with you um, this uh, this afternoon, this evening, in different time zones. And um, I will. I have a PowerPoint presentation that I will share with you now, and uh, we'll just, I think, go in the middle of things and this talk. So here you see the title of my talk. Uh, that's uh, Hannah Arendt's phenomenology of plurality and the role of judgment in actualizing plurality. Since this as I um, was made aware of is the topic of this lecture series. So um, I want to talk about plurality today because I think with uh, her key concept of plurality, Hannah Arendt has not only made an important contribution to political theory, but has in fact rethought the philosophical tradition she came from. And although Arendt never spelled this out systematically, Plurality is a paradigm that introduces the political into philosophical and phenomenological thought. Just, and I want to draw this parallel here, as the paradigm of alterity has provoked an ethical turn in phenomenology epitomized by the work of Emmanuel Levinas. For Arendt, the consequences of this paradigm shift were so grave that she herself said that she broke with the philosophical tradition, at least to a certain extent, since she did not believe that philosophy in its classical form could adequately conceive of what existence in the plural amounts to. Arendt claims that the crisis of the political in the 20th century has historical roots in the inability of Western thinking to consider the notion of plurality as a basic philosophical concept. Instead, philosophy and also political philosophy has limited itself to what she says, the essence of man in the singular. This, as you can already see, in fact, is a very philosophical reason why Arendt refuses to be counted among philosophers and promotes the political um, as the domain of plurality. Consequently, she defines her own enterprise as political theory precisely through the task, quote, 
that to ponder that the fact that men, not man, or one could rather say human beings, live on the earth and inhabit the world, end of quote. Now, one could also argue if one looks at this um, argumentation that this distinction between philosophy and political theory also forces artificial limits onto philosophy. Why could thinking plurality not be a philosophical project unto itself, namely one that might transform philosophy as we used to know it? In fact, I believe that this is what Arendt actually achieved philosophically and that this is what she has done and that's what I want to get into a little bit. And um, you know, we have been mentioning this in our talk before. I will be referring in this talk also a lot to a book that I've written on uh, Hannah Arendt where I try to explain this in detail. And just uh, to give you a sort of a very, very short overview of the big picture here, I have two central claims in, in this book. And the first is that Arendt's notion of the political far from corresponding to any notion of politics, so you have this difference between the political and politics, can be properly explained or understood only when elucidated as a phenomenology of plurality. So that is the main claim I have. And that means that I want to say that we need phenomenology to understand how Arendt is operating. And this is surprisingly not at all a standard statement in the Arendt debate. Only few scholars engage seriously, I think they get more, but uh, only few scholars engage seriously with her phenomenological and existential roots. And if they do, they often only take Heidegger's philosophy into account. However, many of the ideas that Arendt develops how she conceptualizes subjectivity, intersubjectivity, world, and also how she elaborates this via notions of appearance and experience can only be really understood, I think, in its theoretical and systematical depth if one employs a broader phenomenological perspective. And this is what I've tried to do in the book. I try to make a lot of links, uh, not only to Heidegger, but also to Husserl and to Meleponti and to Patochka and to Levinas. And, and try to sort of reinstate her in this um, tradition of thinking, not to sort of place her there or frame her there, but just to bring her in a dialogue, which I think is a very fruitful one for both sides. And this also leads me to the second uh, thesis that is interrelated with the first one. And this is that introducing the paradigm of plurality into phenomenology, as, as Arendt does, transforms its methodology along with its central notions such as intentionality, appearance, the first person perspective, subjectivity, intersubjectivity, world, and so on. And, and that I also try to do in detail uh, in the book. And then there is one last little thing that helps to know what I, what I try to do is that I, I um, add an and an active interpretation of the notion of plurality. So plurality, one could say, is not something that simply is, but plurality is something we have to take up and do. Therefore, it manifests itself only as an actualization of plurality in a space of appearances. And I take this figure as a whole to be what I call the core phenomenon that presents the key to Arendt's related conception of action, of freedom, of the political, and also um, of judgment. So um, this is, was just uh, um, the big uh, picture here. And um, now you get the, we already have the first point behind us. You see the structure of the talk here. Um, I'm gonna get into um, notions of plurality now. Um, first the standard interpretations, then I tried to develop a little bit more what would be a phenomenological approach. And uh, as a last uh, main topic, I try to go to uh, um, the activity of judging um, because this is in the center of the, of the whole um, uh, lecture uh, course and uh, try to throw a light on that uh, from a from a perspective of an architectonics of actualized plurality, if you like. Okay, 
So um, what is uh, plurality? There are, I would call them standard interpretations and they first and foremost start from very famous quotes, which you have here from the beginning of uh, the human condition that uh, plurality uh, is the fact that men, not man, I quoted this already, live on earth and inhabit the world, that we are all the same, that is human in such a way that nobody is ever the same as anyone else who ever lived, lives or will live. And that this paradoxical plural, plurality of unique beings is to be read as, here comes Latin, inter hominis esse, which is the basic condition of both action and speech, and thus the condition of all political life. So this is sort of a short reader's digest of what Arendt says on plurality. Now, the majority of readings is interested in the concrete politics or political principles that follow from such an outline and therefore read the mentioned quotes in a distinctive political way. So for example, as the good that a community tries to attain or um, uh, the difference and, and not identity is at the base uh, of Arendt's political theory um, or uh, solidarity and reciprocity. And these are different interpretations that range from classical Republican ones to radical democratic ones or agonistic or narrativistic ones. And um, I, I, I find this all very justified and also interesting to think about that, especially from a political angle, from an angle of political theory. But uh, sometimes um, these interpretations forget, forget to give an answer to very simple questions that arise when one is confronted with the term plurality. Um, namely the question, what is it actually? Um, why, what does it consist in precisely? And why should we believe that it really exists? So how, how would this show itself? And what does fact in the quote before, the fact of plurality, what does fact actually mean here? Is that an empirical fact? What sort of uniqueness is she talking about? Isn't it just normative or wishful thinking? that each individual is so irreplaceable and unique, which isn't true in the end. Um, in what sense is condition to be understood, the condition of plurality? So these are all maybe more philosophical questions that can come up and we don't find many answers in the political interpretations. And if we look at the philosophical interpretations, I, my opinion is that they are often not as satisfying as the political ones uh, in addressing their aim, because they either take plurality really as a mere quantitative empirical fact, or as an anthropological thesis. And I think this runs the risk of um, just postulating uniqueness as a human property, and that often involves a sort of naive metaphysics of human uniqueness. Um, then what you also find is to understand plurality as a normative concept or a value. Huh? Um, and I, I would think that this tends to obstruct rather than elucidate a more profound interrelation of subjectivity, intersubjectivity, intersubjectivity and world that um, crucially shapes Hannah Arendt's thinking. And that, for example, the feminist author Adriana Cavarero um, has called um, a radical phenomenology. And so if you want to know what I was trying to do is to, to develop exactly that. So um, then let me let me try, and here we already go to the Mm, to the third part of my talk, to now develop um, a phenomenological, a decidedly phenomenological interpretation of the term of plurality. What would that look like? So for that, um, he, I have uh, three points here. And the first one is the um, difference between the who and the what. And um, for that, I think it is, diff it, is, is, it is decisive to understand that by plurality, Arendt neither means a mere quantitative multiplicity nor a differentiation in quality, like for example, unique genetic codes or different socialization processes 
or multiculturally understood diversity. This is, however, what most interpreters suggest when they take plurality just as Arendt's important appreciation of, say, the diversity of different, of people's different lifestyles and opinions. What they do not see is that what Arendt means by point of view is a phenomenological concept of perspectiveness, which avoids any empirical or metaphysical theories about the uniqueness of persons, which otherwise can be read all too quickly into Arendt's um, text. Plurality is hence also not just another word for political pluralism, but involves much more a theory of the subject, the person, the self in intersubjectivity and in the world, the interactive, interactive development of the who in the we, and that can also be a conflictual we. So that's what I hope to make clear. And just for a little bit of fun now, I've tried to do some two drawings. You know how it is with drawings in philosophy. You always have to throw them away in the end. But um, just to give you a, a try of the difference of what I mean by perspectiveness here. So the, the, the first one um, is this um, property view where say the difference is just instantiated by different properties. And the other one, actually, um, if some of you know Husserl, then um, you might see in the drawing that this is a try to draw the phonological reduction, <laughs> but I use it for, I use it, I, I, I try, just try to use it for a term, different term of perspectiveness. And I'll try to explain that a little bit with words, and then you can see what you can do with the drawing or just forget about it again. So plurality is not um, constituted by plurality of properties. It is also not a matter of fact, which is just there. So in the Heideggerian sense of present at hand, vorhanden, like trees or tables. To be sure, there is a quantitative multiplicity of human beings, which are just there, but sheer quantity does not yet make plurality. For that, we need a phenomenological perspective. And that means not to approach the multiplicity of humans from the outside and then explain it in its properties from, so to say, a third person perspective. I look on these little humans here um, and that, that that would be in a in the end that's sort of objectifying you nevertheless Arendt by contrast approaches the issue from the involved experience itself that is from actualizing and experiencing plurality and thus the uniqueness of my and the other standpoints in interaction itself Arendt speaks about the who one is as opposed to the what and um, this, some of you might know, resonates or is a direct indication of a phenological approach because what resonates here in particular is Heidegger's distinction between a who of Dasein and a what of Vorhandensein. So the being of Dasein is not exhausted in being a sheer objective presence like other beings. As Heidegger says, Dasein is, it's there, yeah? So, and in being it's there, Dasein actualizes itself as a special perspective on the world. Being it there is being a perspective on the world. Only within this world, there is a what, which we can describe. If you look at this little square uh, here in the middle where these three um, people are looking at, this would be a what, which we um, can describe. The access, the experiencing itself, is not another what. If we understood it and described it in terms of a what, we would, conf we would confront it like an object. And Arendt's question to that, what makes us unique, in fact, sounds very different than this objectifying kind of view. And here I give you a quote that is uh, quite famous also from the human condition. The manifestation of who the speaker and doer unexchangeably is, Though it is plainly visible, retains a curious intangibility that confounds all efforts towards uh, unequivocal verbal expression. The moment we want to say who somebody is, our very vocabulary leads us astray into saying what he is. We get entangled in a description of qualities he necessarily shares with others like him. We begin to describe a type 
or a character in the old meaning of the world with the result that his specific uniqueness escapes us. It is thus definitely not an empirical description, not even a character description that could disclose the unique who of a speaker and doer. This who does not allow for an objectification or reification without disappearing as what it is, and that is the access to objects and the world. Insofar, it cannot be addressed as a what, and here I would say the positions in phenomenology converge, be it Husserl or Heidegger, Malponti or Arendt. It is exactly this dimension of who or whoness that also Arendt is specifically interested in, in her phenomenological conception of plurality. So because just like my own access to the world cannot be articulated in objectifying third person terminology, so does the others being in access elude this grasp. Plurality is thus a plurality of the who as a plurality of perspectives of being and access to the world. Now it is decisive how this being and access to the world shows itself. And this is why I have spoken of actualized plurality. So um, as you can see here that this decisive thing is this, you have to do something in order to experience and realize plurality as plurality. Otherwise it just remains, if it's not articulated and expressed, then it remains a plurality of what, but not of who. So, and it's not that I and you, so we have to do something uh, with one another and that is to interact. So I have uh, three basic theses here, what actualizing plurality involves. Mm. Third, first of all, it discloses the who, who one is, which constitutes and sustains a we, a web of relationships as a genuinely intersubjective world. And that, thirdly, is a contingent process that depends on its actualization in acting, speaking, and judging. Through acting, speak, speaking, and judging, the second in between, as Arendt calls that, or the web of relationship, not only emerges, but is constantly and necessarily sustained in its existence. The second in between is thus dependent on the constant actualization of these activities. And to give a metaphor or a parallel, maybe it's, uh, I would compare it to like um, the acoustic existence of a piece of music, which is dependent on the musicians playing their instruments. If they don't play, then the music is only on the paper, but what is music on a paper? So um, it has to be actualized. And that means somebody has to do something, and they have to do it together. And that is also how the single voices are sort of articulate themselves. However, acting um, and speaking and judging, this is also important. I don't emphasize this so much in the talk, but we can um, talk about it in the discussion. Acting, speaking and judging are an actual actualization of plurality, which is itself, it, which is not necessarily actualized all the time. So in order to live or just to survive, I'm not dependent on this kind of actualization. I am, however, very dependent on the actualization of my body all the time in order to live. Yeah. Um, so, so it is a fragile, a fragile actualization, that of plurality. It is not something that happens all the time. Yeah. So it can be, can be destroyed, it can be inhibited, it can just not happen. But Arendt says, well, most of the time when people speak and act, it, it does happen. Yeah? Um, so to say a few words also to the who, um, the actualization of plurality discloses the who, the person. This is an important point since it makes clear that Arendt is one of those phenomenologists who think the self-appearance of, of mindness, of jemeinigkeit, in the world and before others. For that reason, Arendt often speaks about the world in the metaphor of the stage. Um, so the, the world is somewhere where we appear um, like on a stage. The mode in which the who shows itself and at the same time eludes the fixation of the what is that of acting and speaking and judging. 
It is intersubjective interaction. The self, let me go here, the self or the who that appears in this interaction um, is not a representative nor a reflection or expression of a substantial inner self. Rather, it gets constituted only in the actualization with others. Appearance, as Arendt says, expresses nothing but itself, that is, it exhibits or displays. This also characterizes Arendt's notion of subjectivity and the self. Being a self is always something that happens with others in a space of appearance and as appearing. In this sense, she deeply shares also Merleau-Ponty's conviction that there is no inner man. In the sense that Arendt thinks being with as the appearance of Jemeinigkeit or minus, she also inverts an essential movement of Heidegger's being and time, in which being an authentic self tends to exceed social forms of being together. Arendt thinks this in a radically new way by transferring the dimension of authenticity from being a self on my own to being a self only amongst others. So how we actualize who we are is never alone. It is thus a relational category, generating a story, being able to act differently than normally, beginning something new. All these actions are only possible and only attain their real meaning when we are in the plural. There are no stories without other people, or at least one who watches us, and no surprises if there is no background of expectancies. The basic condition for the possibility of something like a gestalt of the who, thus requires a background we of, and in English Arendt says sheer human togetherness, in German it's miteinander sein, and this also um, directly relates to, to Heidegger. So, um, that is a short look on sort of the, the general layout of what would a phenological approach to plurality uh, look like. And I will now go to um, judgment. Um, and what well, I see, I would now go to judgment and uh, try to develop that a little bit uh, more because Arendt focuses on a distinguished form of existence possibility in articulating one's perspective on the world before others, and thereby inaugurating a me and a we. And this is actualized in distinguished activities that she singles out and that I've mentioned them often before now, acting, speaking, and judging. To conceive of judging in direct connection with speaking and acting is not a very common move in the interpretation of Arendt's work. Judging is usually connected to the much, much more to the context of the life of the mind, or Arendt's involvement with the Eichmann case, or her anti-teleological concept of history and her self-conception as a theoretician and a non-involved commentator. Um, that is all fine, but what I will try to do here is that I pursue a reading that locates judgment within the unfolding of the phenomenon of actualized plurality. So if we have speech, we discover a basic background we before which the gestalt of the who appears. This also comes to pass in action in a more intensified level, I would say, and interaction with others. And judging now forms a third level that lifts the whole event to yet another dimension, that of spectators who watch and judge the happenings. Because if Aaron talks about a stage, then what is a stage without sort of uh, um, the people who, who are the guests and sit there and watch and comment the events? They can also be actors in, at one point, of course, but the stage needs also spectators uh, and judges. The space of visibility becomes a qualified space through this activity since public events are assessed, evaluated, and considered from different angles. On the other hand, the otherwise futile happenings of action and speech are extended, consolidated, and amplified by the judgment of the spectators. This involves a temporal as well as an institutional dimension, since the public can only be sustained if people actively engage in a common but not necessarily consensual constitution of meaning. 
judging it thus makes something like the architectonics of a space of plurality complete. It's sort of, uh, um, yeah, it's the last stone in this architectonics. It builds on the two other activities of speech and action and like them represents a peculiar interwovenness of the conditions of natality and plurality. Now, let me just um, mention a few general themes and specific Kantian topics um, in Arendt's conception of plurality. Um, because, um, yeah, um, as, as you might know, I think uh, that, that might have been a topic already in the other talks, reflective um, judgment um, is something that Arendt takes from Kant's uh, critique of judgment and aesthetic judgment, especially. And um, it's him where Arendt says this is especially developed. And she also thinks that Kant is um, one of the very few thinkers of plurality in uh, his uh, elaboration of um, aesthetic judgment. Um, also because Kant, she says, recognized the pleasure that we take in exercising our freedom of judgment together, an activity that makes us feel at home in the world. So the relevant key concepts that we can take from Kant are the following very shortly. For Kant, aesthetic judgment is uh, reflective judgment and reflective judgment does not assume, uh, um, subsume a given particular under an established rule like by contrast, determining judgment does, for example, this is um, a pencil. Uh, okay, you see it here. Um, instead, it reflects on the particular as an exemplary for a rule yet to be found. So I'm not asking myself if this is a pencil or not, but if I find it beautiful. Kant presents aesthetic judgment as a peculiar practice, which can neither be reduced to objective judgments, which are either true or false, not to simple statements about our sensations. So I, I like this or something like that. For Kant, judging the beauty of an object does not concern recognizing any properties which would make it beautiful. That would be a determining objective judgment. It is, that is the tricky thing about it. It is judging the feeling of pleasure of the subject with respect to the appearing object and a community of judges. So it's actually a threefold relation. However, this does not mean, as I mentioned before, that we simply report our private feelings and sensations. If I say, I like blue, and then say, you like yellow, I like spinach, you like peas, whatever. In aesthetic judgment, much more is involved. Kant elaborates upon this in his analytic of the beautiful where he says that an aesthetic pleasure is not something immediate, like sensuous pleasure, but distance and disinterested pleasure, interesse loses wohlgefallen, that takes no direct interest in the existence of the object. Also, this special sort of pleasure is not simply a passive response, but demands an active involvement of our mental capacities. So what Kant says is that we use the operations of reflection and imagination and engage in an active process of aesthetic judgment instead of a passive response and precisely to distance ourselves from only a passive response of, um, yeah, I like this or I find this disgusting or whatever. And try to establish through the reflection and imagination a standpoint of enlarged mentality. German, this is erweiterte Denkungsart. And this means that we take into account different standpoints, different perspectives and different angles, and thereby put our judgment to the test, modify and question it. This also means that the peculiar feeling of aesthetic pleasure is first of all, and that is interesting, it is first of all a pleasure in the commun communicability of the pleasure so that I can share it. Um, since it is not only rooted in our private sensibility. And this is also what makes our aesthetic judgment so different from mere reports of our mental or sensory states. Aesthetic judgment makes a claim on intersubjective validity. And I'm also, I'm already using this term intersubjective, which Kant does not use. 
he says subjective universality. I get, get back to that. Um, but what Kant very closely observes is that we care about the validity of our aesthetic judgments. We take a normative stance on them in that we imply that others should consent to them. Nobody would make such a normative claim for mere sensory responses, like saying you should not find, or you ought not to find oysters tasteful. You ought not to do that. So we normally don't, don't do that. But with aesthetic judgments, we say, what, you really, you, find, you found that film really good? Huh? So there is a much more normative um, 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 appeal in these judgments. Yet the peculiar thing is that this claim on validity is not verifiable or provable by arguments as happens with objective claims to validity since it concerns. So objective claims, this is a pencil um, uh, that we can uh, examine sort of the empirical validity of my statement. Um, but in aesthetic pleasure, the problem is that it concerns the feeling of the subject. So this feeling, says Kant, nevertheless claims subjective universality. So um, subjective allgemeingültigkeit. And that is the strange thing about it. It is not that to say, well, my feeling is just I like hot baths and you might not like that. Who cares? But it claims subjective universality. And how is this possible? Because I can never know if I have really achieved this subjective universality, since the pleasure I feel is the only possible symptom of this universality. And subjective pleasure obviously can never be made a mode of knowledge except about myself. That's the only way to find out, and that is interesting, this mode of validity, the only way to find out is to put my judgment to the test in intersubjective discourse and entice it to others to consent to it. In German, Kant uses this wonderful word ansinnen, where sin is always something like senses, meaning, and ansinnen is to confront you with that. Yeah? Um, we thus appeal to something that is not objective and therefore not objectively provable, but something that is common to us in a subjective or rather an intersubjective way. This appeal to something intersubjectively common is of course not empirical, it is normative. It is more an appeal to something that should be common to us than to something that factually is common to us. This normative commonality is called sensus communis by Kant. On the one hand, we have to appeal to it to make our aesthetic judgments. On the other hand, aesthetic discourse itself endows and actualizes it precisely in the appeal to it. So this is something you make a claim to, and by making a claim to it, you actually build it in, in the togetherness of making these claims. So to this complicated structure of first, a normative claim that I cannot prove, but only discuss. Second, my pleasure as a self-referential indication for that claim, since it is the pleasure and the communicability of my pleasure which is the ground of my aesthetic judgment. And third, the sensus communis, which is endowed by appealing to it, Kant adds as a fourth point, the transcendental principle of purposiveness without purpose through the aid of which reflective judgment takes on its particular reflective character. Um, to explain it very shortly, one could say that the principle in play in aesthetic experience, it, 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 or Kant says it, it's a, it is a principle in play in aesthetic experience insofar as it seems as if the object were there to induce pleasure in me and quicken my mental faculties, as he says. This makes us feel at home in the world and with others, even if an objective purpose is not to be discovered. So these are sort of the, the, the main uh, key concepts. Um, no, one, one very last one is freedom, of course. I forgot that. Last but not least, definitely. Kant insists that we are free in a very pure and special sense when we perform aesthetic judgments. Why? Neither are we compelled by objective necessity, like in epistemic judgments, 
nor are we restricted to the privacy of our feelings when we are simply affected by something, nor are we coerced by practical reason when we ought to obey to the categorical imperative and the moral judgments. So the freedom that we exercise in aesthetic judgment is thus the only absolutely independent practice what reflectively pleases or displeases us as a community of judges is our very own affair, an affair of a community of judges. That's why Kant also says, um, neither animals nor angels have this aesthetic uh, capacity. Kind of. It's a very human thing for Kant. Mm. Okay, so I get to Arendt's um, phenomenological translation of Kant's theory of judgment and the first a very quick uh, point would be, and I guess since other people might have talked about that as well, I keep that rather short, that Arendt, of course, makes this a very unusual interpretation of saying, well, what Kant says about aesthetic judgment is actually something that we can um, use for political judgment because there are similarities that are very important. Single events are judged. There is no determinate judgment uh, possible and no objective um, knowledge possible, for example, if you have conflicts of uh, deep disagreement, say, um, I don't know, a uh, uh, question of abortion, for example, um, you can make arguments on both sides and you can sort of, you cannot, there is, there is no third party that looks at it from outside and decides this is right and this is wrong, but you have to argue for it. But arguments never bring you sort of to, to the perspective of the other. So a specific mode of discussion is necessary. And also we have here this normative claim to a sensus communis. We think in our political opinions that others should think that way, although we cannot objectively um, uh, prove it like uh, with scientific truths or something like that. And uh, all of this um, is sort of uh, um, establishing a mode of pluralistic reason that includes affectivity in Arendt's interpretation and um, uh, a special mode of uh, intersubjective justification of judgments. Now, Arendt's um, main uh, move is that, um, sorry, that um, she translates reflective judgment into the space of appearances and not in so much in the transcendental discourse like Kant does. This. And thereby, that's what I would claim, she completes her architecture or her phenomenological conception of a worldly space that is distinctively constituted by plural perspectives. Mm. So if it can be considered, of course, that Arendt was always a Kantian. Kant has been a very important influence for her. I think one must also emphasize that Arendt's Kant is, a, is very different from, for example, Habermas and Kant. Plurality for Arendt is not a, ration, a rationally discursive principle, an embodiment of communicative reason, but rather an appearing phenomenological plurality. Her Kantian heritage does not focus on principles produced by or deducted from reason, but on the phen phenomenal world which Kant had especially been attentive to in the third critique. So Arendt's accomplishment of translating Kant's reflective judgment into a phenological framework consists in the following features, I would say. Reflective judgment, both in Arendt's and Kant's view, is judgment of the appearance of a particular thing or event. But while for Kant, this judgment is made possible through the common structure of our mental faculties that come to the fore when we abstract from all, private and empirical conditions, and this is his transcendental argument, Arendt says something different. She says it's possible because of the fundamental fact of plurality, that is of plural irreducible perspectives on a common world. So what we thus have in common, according to Arendt, is not primarily a structure that is the same for everyone, because that is the claiming Kant, but in a common world. This is also how Arendt avoids an outdated conception of monological reason, as she has received criticism for by the Frankfurt School, Velma, Ben Habib, Habermas, etc. What she undertakes is instead a genuine transformation, a transposition of Kant's theory 
by understanding his notion of subjective universality as intersubjectivity, as in between subjects and not as the multiplication of one's, one structure in many subjects. That I think is the main difference. This transformation concurs with the phenomenological tradition's task of reformulating Kant's transcendental philosophy as an intersubjective constitution and embeddedness in a common world. If Arendt does in any way detranscendentalizes Kant, as some authors claim, she does so, I would say, in a phenomenological way. And this way keeps in play conditioning, and I would say, yes, transcendental elements, namely pl plural perspectives. Hence, the most interesting feature of this newly situated mode um, of, uh, of judgment um, is how Arendt conceives its dependence on plurality. This is reflected in the techniques by which it is achieved, as well as in the special mode of intersubjective validity. Her phenomenological translation of reflective judgment is thus a deliberate articulation of perspectivity with respect to worldly commonality. For Kant, the articulation of aesthetic judgment is more about subjective universality than it is about reflected perspectivity, since the perspective being empirical is rather that which should be abandoned for Kant or at least ignored in the process of reflection. For Arendt, in contrast, it is precisely perspective in the plural, which is the condition of the possibility of judgment. Therefore, she puts a much stronger emphasis on Kant's technique of uh, enlarged or enlarging mentality than on his transcendental argument on shared faculties. Enlarging mentality is of special interest to Arendt because it is a technique or a practice that maintains the first person perspective's autonomy and spontaneity, and at the same time takes into account a plurality of perspective. It might surprise a bit that Arendt says, well, enlarged mentality is not empathy or sympathy. It is not about understanding what others feel or think, which would then influence my judgment. Rather, it deals with the question what it would be like if I were in each of these positions and had to judge. The picture that emerges is thus not one which includes or accumulates the other's standpoint. Would I judge equally? Uh, sorry, the picture that emerges is thus not one which includes or accumulates the other's opinions, but which forms mine by othering my standpoint. Would I, so I travel, through, so Kant nicely says we should teach our imagination to make visits, to travel to other standpoints. So would I judge, what I ask myself, would I judge equally if I were in that position and still claim that my judgment is valid? and communicable to many? Or would nobody find it comprehensible that I took such a stance? Arendt calls this representative thinking, and this is uh, one quote that you might have already come across with uh, in this um, lecture course. It's also a very famous quote from Between Past and Future. I form an opinion by considering a different issue from different viewpoints by making present to my mind the standpoints of those who are absent. That is. I represent them. This process of representation does not blindly adopt the actual views of those who stand somewhere else and hence look upon the world from a different perspective. So that's why Arendt says it's not empathy. This is a question neither of empathy as though I tried to be or feel like somebody else, nor of counting noses and joining a majority, but of being and thinking my own identity where actually I am not. The more people's standpoints I have present in my mind while I'm pondering a given issue and the better I can imagine how I would feel and think if, if I were in their place, the stronger will be my capacity for representative thinking and the more valid my final conclusions, my opinion. How can this enlarged way of looking at things as me, but from multiple perspectives, acquire intersubjective validity. Trying to make my judgment more valid means trying to make it more communicable. So um, 
this not only implies that we share a world of objects and events to judge, it means that we confirm that we relate to the same world in ways about which we can communicate, which we can understand. Now, this is a very a problem that we have a lot at the moment that we don't even know if we are relating to the same issue or the same world or if everybody's in their bubbles and this communication is not happening anymore. As long as you sort of, you can have contradicting opinions, but if you don't even know anymore that you're talking about the same thing, then you lose sort of this common world. And that's why you constantly have to re to find out and, and, and change perspectives to create this census communis. Um, so um, enticing the consent of others keeps the process of communication and world building going. Plurality, as we have seen, is therefore not only a primary condition for enlarged thinking and thereby actualized in reflective judgment, the validity claim of such a judgment, which can never be absolute, actualizes plur plurality a second time, precisely because it is a validity in dispute. Debate therefore continues and further stimulates plurality. Furthermore, I have to encourage as many people as possible to judge as well, since my judgment is not valid for those who do not judge or for those who are not members of the public realm where the object of judgments appear. A strong mode of sociability and expansion of the political and public world is thus implied in the acquisition of validity for my judgment. And this is uh, sort of, uh, I think, the, the, where it boils down to this whole, when, if I say I want to read judgment as an actualization of plurality, um, then this quote would be um, uh, really what it boils down to. Judging is one, if not the most important activity in which this sharing the world with others comes to pass. Okay, so that's it. Just the, the slide of conclusion, um, but it's just a short summary. Actualized plurality, from logically explicated, is the key, I think, that's my claim, to Arendt's notion of the political. It describes the plurality of irreducible perspectives on a common world. In interaction, each one's being a perspective is articulated and disclosed. At the same time, this constant actualization sustains the shared and common world in the sense of a second in between. This web of relationships is as important in constituting our reality as the objective world itself. And it comes to pass very much in the activity of judging. Okay, so, so much from my side. Thanks very much for your attention. And I think I will um, uh, close the presentation. Yeah. Thank you very much, Sophia. It was uh, brilliant. I, uh, I have to say that uh, being one that uh, wrote a PhD thesis on Arendt's phenomenology, phenomenological um, uh, origins, origins uh, I would say, uh, it's amazing how how you could uh, present us with such difficult uh, such di difficult subjects with so much clarity. Uh, I would start by um, so c congratulations. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. I will start by by reading you uh, the first the first comment uh, slash question mm -hmm. by uh, Lucas Barreto. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he, he states, if I may, I would like to share some of my few thoughts about this, and I would like to know your opinion. Uh, well, uh, as you, I also read Arendt as a phenomenological thinker. I would like to ask you if you see some existential hermeneutic roots in our theory and method. Arendt's thought, thought engages itself in order to understand the world, the plurality, and so on, uh, the phenomena. So it seems to me that the difference between truth and meaning plays a central role in her thoughts. Arendt aims the reconciliation with the world through understanding and meaning, not through truth. So her, her phenomenology has its roots also in the hermeneutic, 
that since she doesn't intend to find the truth about the world, but the plurality of meanings and interpretations about the world. What do you think about this? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, thank you uh, very much, Lucas Polito, for your question. Um, so I think I want to take up two points. The first one is the hermeneutic thing, and the second one that about meaning and truth that is, of course, connected. Um, I know that I don't mention the herm hermeneutics that much in, in, uh, in, in my book, but I think that comes from the fact that I very much think that from uh, sort of with Heidegger entering the picture, that you cannot, that there is not really any more of a logical approach that, that rules out hermeneutics, but it's very much integrated. So I have a hard time totally separating those two perspectives and then saying, well, this is a phenological aspect and this is a hermeneutic one. Why? Because I think that 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 Heidegger makes it really uh, beautifully clear that that uh, sort of we we always are and 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 I would say I mean if you if you if you're charitable, you can read that into the phenological tradition as a whole, that that it's always about meaning, yeah? um, and and intentionality is the source of something to have meaning at all, and it's always the as something as something always requires that uh, that something can be seen from different angles and from different perspectives. So I think that doing phenomenology only say as a rigid eidetic method where you think you can do completely without hermeneutics is difficult. And I think that, um, that even Husserl would completely agree to that in the sense that he talks about making meaning fluid um, by trying to analyze how it has been constituted and looking at it from different angles. So I think that is that is the reason why I would I would not see a, say a contradiction between um, phenomenology and hermeneutics here, which you might not have uh, uh, meant, but th that's just a clarification from my side. The thing with meaning and truth, is that I, I think I, in a first step, I agree. And in a second step, I just want to um, add uh, a thought just to avoid the misconception that many people have when they say, well, if it's not about truth, then this is this sort of postmodern conception of politics and then we can say anything and then you know I mean it, it, aren't there some facts and so on and so forth and and that's why I would like to um, tone that down a little bit and not make truth and meaning an opposition because of course Arendt cares about facts uh, she only says that um, facts alone and and I think she also claims that of course not everything is interpretation. I think her example is uh, in this wonderful um, uh, essay on truth and politics um, that um, it will be very hard to make it a question of interpretation if in the second uh, in the first world war um, Germany attacked Belgium or Belgium attacked Germany. So that is not a matter of opinion, but a matter of fact. Um, so I think it's very clear that she she cares about. Um, uh, empirical truth. I think where where she really has a problem with is something like um, metaphysical or something like absolute or religious truth in the political realm, um, because uh, she I think she would say that this is a sort of a claim that rules out plurality from the first uh, step. So and in this sense, I would say that I would absolutely agree with you that she focuses on meaning. And I would like to make this um, parallel um, that compares, you know, pure life to plurality, where she says plurality is so much richer. Of course, life is a condition for plurality, but plurality adds uh, sort of perspectiveness. And the same thing is that meaning can also not 
do um, uh, cannot be totally disconnected from truth. There is not a realm of truth here and the realm of meaning there, but uh, certainly truth is a sort of meaning. Yeah, and um, and meaning cannot work without the difference between true and not true. So, um, but meaning again is so much richer. And so we can we can have uh, empirical truths and say, okay, X uh, happened at the place of Y in the time of set. But then how do we see it and what are our perspectives on it and how do we judge it? And that is just so much more that can never be replaced by another truth. So and and that that is what what makes and, and that is also the narratives we have and the meaning the the reason why we think that life is meaningful is not because it's a just a, a chain of truths but um, something that uh, we can engage in and in in that sense I I, I think um, yeah I, I I would agree that she puts an emphasis on that. Thank you, Sophie. Uh, Antonio um, asks, uh, does the expression actualizing plurality mean that plurality is not always present and active? Or does it mean that plurality is always present, but not always consciously noticed and explicitly put into action? Yeah, th thanks also very much, Antonio, for that, uh, uh, for that question. Um, it's a point that I did not emphasize so much in the talk, but actually um, I think uh, uh, it is a main feature in Arendt's political theory that she says, look, plurality does not automatically happen. Um, it can be so, and, and, and most of you will know that uh, she also has a, uh, so this notion of society um, where she would say, well, you know, I mean, we can just live in consumerist society and we don't have to express plurality. I mean, we don't because in a certain way, um, actualizing plurality is something that that um, needs to be done and where I need to form a standpoint and where I need to uh, sort of reflect also, um, it's, it's not, it, isn't, it doesn't just blurt out like that. I mean, in a certain sense, it does. When I appear on a stage and I'm, I'm, I'm sort of, my uniqueness is, is something that is in, and your uniqueness is something that, that is in the whole of what you are. You cannot really hide that. But on the other hand, um, the, the the articulation of plurality is also more than that. It, it requires that we dare come out there and show ourselves and say what we think and act. And, and, and that does not happen. I mean, there is also, I mean, I think this is also something that of course goes back to Heidegger when Heidegger nicely poses that question, say, I mean, what is what is Dasein's uh, sort of uh, um, normal form of existence? It's not being an I, it's being what everybody does. And, and what everybody does um, is not, necessary in the, not necessarily an actualization of plurality. So that is one thing. The other much more grave thing is that Arendt's um, thesis vis-a-vis -vis totalitarianism is that totalitarianism directly tries to attack and destroy plurality with sort of the most extreme form in the in the death camps um, and 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 that is why she also says look um, plurality is something that that can really be so that, I think that in this in this case she does not say it's still there but she leaves it open and it's always a kind of discourse where she wants to appeal to us and say look it does not happen automatically and it can be and it can be attacked and it can be destroyed and we have to do something to to make it um how do you formulate it here to to make it explicit i would not say consciously noticed really because it's not about a third perspective that sits out there somewhere and then says now it happens but it's really to to put it to put it out there, and um, 
And if you ask, if, is it always present? The thing is that, of course, the, the, what I try to say is that the, 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 the sheer quantity of world accesses, if you like, is of course present. But what does present mean if instruments don't play? You know, I mean, it's like an instrument that does not use its, its capacity to play, to be played. And that's why I would say it is there, but it remains mute. It can always, of course, break out. That can always happen. That's also the nice thing about plurality. You cannot really control it. Um, so that totalitarianism wants to do that and is very good at it. Um, but, uh, but, but that's also not a total guarantee. But it's really like, uh, yeah, like, yeah, that's why I often use this metaphor of instruments. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Sophie. I, I would like to ask you uh, some questions also, because and they're related with these two uh, uh, previous questions. Mm -hmm. um, one of them is, uh, uh, is regarding the relationship between the social and political, which is a divisive mm -hmm. uh, reading of Arendt and um, and how, how do you see uh, uh, the relation between those um, perspectives on, on life or, or existence, let's say, uh, from a phenomenological point of view? Do you, do you think that they, Arendt's view is able to answer the criticism that some uh, address to, to her as lacking, her, her political views as lacking a relationship with the social demands and uh, mm. social mm. justice and so on. And mm. the, other, the other question is related also with this one, is that uh, uh, from what I could um, understand, your, your uh, interpretation uh, allows us to see in Arendt's political views also a, a normative uh, 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 dimension or, or stance that uh, some say is lacking, that they're lacking. Uh, some say they're, they're, they're only mm. descriptive uh, and not prescriptive. Mm. Uh, mm. But uh, mm. in so much as you um, define the, the conditions of possibility, let's say, uh, of, of uh, plurality, you are in, in, in a way establishing a normative or uh, uh, condition, let's, mm. let's say. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Let me start with the second one. So, I mean, I, I would argue that there is something like an ethics of plurality in Arendt's um, whole conception, which she does not articulate that much because she has uh, problems with moral philosophy. That's why I would also, why I would call it an ethics. And I would say if she has one normative principle, it is that one should enhance the happenings of the actualizations of plurality um, and, and, and should try to avoid everything that diminishes plurality. I think that really is a normative principle that is in play all the time. Why? Because, and that brings me to the second uh, question, because the matters of life are always more urgent. And, uh, and, and I mean, you could say, and I, I absolutely understand the criticisms that come from the Marxist perspective, for example, and say, yeah, but it's more urgent and because it's more urgent. <laughs> that's, why, that's why plurality is, is a luxury. And Arendt um, says, well, look, if you think of it as a luxury, then you risk very quickly of getting into a logic of big processes where only sort of life counts and the individual in its uniqueness um, tends to be subdued by big processes, be it, be it life, be it the capital, be it whatever, as we see it in globalization more and happening more and more. I mean, also in, in the logic of pandemics and so on and so forth. Um, and um, so I, I think that Many things are not convincing about Arendt's differentiation of between the social and political. If you want to see it as a substantive uh, differentiation, I agree with the authors who criticize that, and who say, "Well, we should see it as a perspective taking rather than so so a matter 
um, the, the, it is a certain mode to view something in a political mode or in a social one. Um, and uh, I also absolutely agree with that statement by Richard Bernstein, who says, well, uh, the difference between what is political and what is social is a totally political question. So um, it's not as if one could easily uh, draw that. So, the, so that's how you can repoliticize sort of these questions as well. But I think that if you want to, I mean, of course, Arendt is not the, the, the author for social justice, but um, I think that she just tries to warn us that conceptions of social justice that do not include the logic of plurality run a certain risk of uh, um, being uh, big, big, big ideas um, that come down on humanity, but uh, that that will, in fact, well, um, either either not work. That would be the the, the least problematic thing, but uh, try to abolish plurality in the worst kind of ways so and, and I think that does it, it's just a warning against it this she, she never says I'm against social justice of course uh, thanks uh, just just one one uh, short comment I, I tend to view a, a distinction between the social and the political not as a closed uh, distinction but uh, as somewhat of um, something of a, a, a parallel to Husserl's uh, natural attitude and phenomenological uh, attitude, mm -hmm. the political being the phenomenolo phenomenological attitude and uh, mm -hmm. the social being the same, the same experience, but from a natural point of view, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, from a natural attitude. Mm -hmm. uh, and therefore, I don't see, see them as, uh, I think you, you, you mm -hmm. said you, you, you don't also, uh, as, as strictly um, closed uh, views and separated views but uh, they mm -hmm. are exactly the same experience but but viewed from di different point of views mm -hmm. uh, perhaps i don't know yeah yeah uh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um uh, lucas uh, asks could, could we talk about two levels of plurality one related to the earth plur plur plurality uh, is the law of the earth uh, uh, and the other related to the common world, plurality is specifically the condition of all political life. Um, uh, and then I would need a little bit more of explanation what that difference would amount to. Because um, I, I would say that the difference between earth and world is not the thing that is decisive here. I think um yeah I, I i guess i have to i have to um give uh, the question back for a little bit more uh, elaboration because what i did not mean i mean the law of the earth in the sense of um yeah we are many factically sort of um and then, if, if that is if that is what is what is meant, maybe by the by the comment that the one is sort of the mere third person quantitative aspect, um, and the other is the actualized aspect. But I think what I want to say is that uh, it, you will never get to a politics of plurality, plurality um, if if you don't see it as a worldly phenomenon. So. That's why I would be a bit hesitant, but maybe it helps to, to rephrase it a little bit. Uh, Lucas, I don't know if you want to open your mic. Yeah. Of course. Uh, I'll go, go ahead, uh, thanks. Okay. Hi. Uh, uh, hi. Well, what I'm trying to, to, to say is that when you, we read the life of the mind, we can, uh, we can see there a uh, news of plurality not, not only in a political sense. We see Arendt talking about li other living beings, uh, some, I don't know, uh, way which we are in the, the, the earth. 
and not only with regarding to to our actions, to the public space, and it does not seem like the same thing that she puts in the human condition when she talks about the public space, the the agon of the the action of the plurality of man. So I'm not sure if it's the same thing that she's trying to say in the human condition and in the the human condition. So that's the the, mm -hmm. the problem to me about some possibility about the the two levels of plurality okay. or, or even of the, the, the appearance itself. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. That helps very much. Now I now I know um, where where sort of the the, the question lies. Um, so I'm aware that there are different interpretations. I would say that um, it is not a break. It is not a different thing, but it is a, an, an expansion of the same theory. And and um, and so if if you look at the life of the mind. I mean, she's uh, also interested in, she says, every, everybody enjoys appearing, sort of appearing before others and relating to animals and this, this uh, theory by this uh, Portman. Um, and, um, but what still remains uh, in this book is that, um, that uh, human beings seem to have the highest capacity of expressing uh, their uniqueness so it is more of a sort of it goes like that I would say um, uh, so, so she, she, she seems to claim that every, every living being that has that is conscious um, can, can take notice of, of the others and so it's a world is always a shared world and um, I, 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 would, I would say that this is already a sort of world not in a political sense but a shared world in a constitutive uh, sense um for which we don't have to have the or for yeah where, where you don't have to be able to speak for example um of course we share a world also with animals because we don't i don't run into the tree that the dog sees or something like that um but uh, and and we have different and and that also goes back to these very interesting um, interpretations of um, Heidegger in this lecture course on Aristotle, where he um, talks a lot about sort of the way in which animals um, uh, show their way of being effectively related to the world, in 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 pleasure and pain and fear and whatever and. And these are already. I mean, there is not a there is not a big break here, yeah? but this, these are already kind of world relations, but maybe poor of world, as Heidegger says. But but we already have uh, plural beings in a way that that do take notice of one another and that do constitute, in the Husserlian way of speaking, a common a common world, and then. And then um, speech and action in the human sense sort of have the possibility to constitute a political world, which is the specific correlate, I would say, for these human capacities. And which is why, and there we have a very Aristotelian motive, I would say, um, this, is, this is why sort of uh, this is our differentia specifica, and this is also why this makes the most sense for us uh, in, in, in a certain kind of way. So I, I would I would say it's a continuity of, of, of articulations of plurality. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sophie. Uh, um, I will now uh, give the floor to Tiago and then because we're uh, reaching our time, uh, then and, and we don't want to tire you. Uh, we, uh, I will read you uh, after Tiago the last question and then Okay. Tiago, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lloyd, and good evening. Good afternoon to Brazilian friends. I'll try to, to express myself uh, orally, in spite of the broken English. Uh, I, me too. I also have written a PhD thesis on Arendt, trying to connect her more closely with the phenomenological tradition. And uh, it was a different approach 
considering this of yours, or at least from the presentation. And I'd like to hear from you what you what's your opinion about it, because from my approach, I mentioned or not, I stressed the break with the tradition. So I took the idea that using phenomenology, she she took her tools to especially break with the tradition. So that was my 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 main general approach, so to speak. Well, on, on the thesis, I, I intended to do two things, but I didn't have time to it, so I cut it and I focused only on the concept of human being, of man, to use traditional uh, language, uh, especially on the opposition between the a human nature and a human condition. And I took, and well, from the way I, I, I wrote it, it, to me, on the human condition, on the first pages, she tries to, on the whole human condition book, she tries to dissubstantiate, to avoid the idea of substance of human beings. That's what everybody says, what everybody knows. But I think that she, she did so by uh, relying on the idea, on the problem of the differentia specifica. Because human beings are beings that are uh, very, cannot be defined. We cannot find the actual definition of human beings we cannot find its differential specific consider regarding other uh, animals. So I think that what she did on the human condition was she took the last great definition of man, Marx definition of man, and she uses this Marx definition to dismantle the tradition uh, regarding this concept. So she took time and she showed that um, in, the, in the Marxist definition of man, there, were, there are two different times, a circular time of labor, in a rectilinear time of work that makes history. And she splits it, uh, imploding, imploding his uh, definition. And besides that, she also adds a third time, a third activity, which is action, that uh, opens a time of, as a beginning with its reversibility and unpredictability. And this is the way in using time and using phenomenology that she breaks with the tradition Using Marx as the guidepost, she uses this expression, you know, on, a, on an essay. So yeah, so I would like to, to know what uh, what is uh, what do you think would be a good relation between Arendt and tradition, considering her her closeness to the phenomenology tradition. I, I hope we have. I hope it's clear. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, thank you very much, um, and, and and thanks for this. Um, yeah, letting me know about um, your approach. Um, so. Um, I mean, it's. I think it's absolutely super justified to emphasize the the break with the tradition. But my enterprise was somewhat different. I had the impression that Arendt. So to say it in a very colloquial kind of way, whenever you do Arendt on real phenomenology conferences. Um, there will be something like, yeah, but she's not really seriously arguing, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. So, um, so if you do Husserl, you are a serious researcher. If you do Heidegger, if you do Arendt, you're kind of, mm. and I think that partly apart from, you know, being a woman in the academic uh, or philosophical um, world, um, she has not done herself um, such a favor when she always said, I have broken with philosophy, I've broken with, and, and this is a gesture that she also says, I mean, since Nietzsche, everybody has broken with everything all the time. So, so it's kind of, it also becomes a sort of gesture of the philosophical intellectual to, to break uh, the tradition. And um, and of course, I mean, I, I completely agree that, that, that uh, there is also, um, one has to take into account also then the Holocaust uh, that, that, that is another break and so on and so forth. But what I wanted to do is to show continuous lines. So I had a sort of a, 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 a that, that, and that's why I rather emphasize the notion of transformation than of break. And I think that, you know, I mean, many others like Sartre or so could also be viewed as people who break a lot with uh, tradition. So Heidegger himself, for that matter. And it's interesting that you address this differentia specifica thing since we had it in the last question. I think Arendt is a little bit, I mean, thinking about it, you are of course right. I mean, Arendt comes from Heidegger, 
where the essence of human being is his existence and but but of course i mean one has to be clear about that existence can be spelled out in its structures in its its in its existentials and of course they have an eidetic kind of uh, uh, um, character huh? they are not substantive uh, uh, essences anymore but sort of pr pr procedural ones or structural ones and Arendt does deny that a little bit with the Heidegger with Jaspers and says, well, but you know, even that is even more historical than Heidegger might think. So, but on the other hand, as I, you know, referring back to my other answer, I think she does have a very clear, I mean, she just thinks that speech and action are the highest capacity of human beings. I, 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 I mean, and, and maybe this is not wrong, yeah? but, but I think this, it does not go together with saying, oh, we cannot say anything about human beings because uh, they, they, are only, they only determine themselves by their existence. So there is a kind of ambivalence, I would say. Um, but um, but uh, the, the reformulation, and, and here I'd, I'd, I'd agree, I mean, I haven't worked on it in these kind of temporal um, dimensions, but rather viewed um, um, laboring, working and acting in terms of their intentionalities, which includes temporal dimension, but not only that, um, is I think with, with the condition the notion of condition, she tries to reformulate and ground a little bit more the notion of existentials in Heidegger. So it is, of course, a going away from, from um, substance notions, that's clear, but that's the case for all of them, you know, like Malpunti, Sartre, Heidegger, where they, they would all, you know, um, completely sign up with that. I think the and, and, and I mean, they also talk about conditions. Sartre talks about the human condition. Camus does it. Um, and, and I think in Arendt, she, she, she tries to, to, to reformulate these notions of existentials in an even more worldly uh, kind of, of way. But that's, that's, I think, what I, what I would add to what you said. Thanks a lot. Uh, and now for... Mm -hmm. We have a question from Jaderson, says, thank you so much for your presentation and for your brilliant and inspiring book. In light of your interpretation of Hannah Arendt's work, do you think it would be, it would be possible to trace some Hegelian elements in her political writings, uh, for instance, political participation and even the distinction between the social, civil society and the political, political community? Yeah, thank you. I mean, I really am not a Hegelian. So um, I guess, I mean, I've, I've read some papers that do suggest this, but that would be quite a, I mean, it would be quite a task in so far. Arendt, of course, has all kinds of problems with uh, Hegel. So one would have to reintroduce a more, um, yeah, like a more Hegel that is used a lot in today's uh, political um, interpretations. And of course, one can very quickly think of Honneth, for example, but I would then caution, and for one specific thing, Arendt never talks about recognition, mutual recognition of each other's appearance. And she could have done that. It, she could have easily done that, but she avoids doing that. And an interpretation that uh, wants to make Hegel strong would have to sort of find out, I think, why this is not the case, and not immediately equate it. Um, and 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 I, because I think there is something to it, I cannot say more than that. It's just an intuition. But uh, but I guess um, I think it's not impossible. Also, with this difference between the social and political society and so on. But um, there are some some knots that one would have to tie anew. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot. Well, I. I... We we'll have to end it here. I thank you very much for your brilliant talk. It was amazing. Uh, and for your book. Uh, I hope people uh, read it because it's very good. Uh, and uh, thank you once again. Uh, I hope we.
talk to you soon again for another book, another event, something like that. And um, let's keep in touch. That's fantastic. Thanks so much. It was a real pleasure to talk and discuss with you. And um, yeah, I wish you all the best and uh, hope we can meet someday in real in the real world. <laughs> yes, exactly. Okay. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye